customers are requesting. And in some cases, they are demanding low carbon products. And it's not only the customer, you go to the investors, the same thing. The path to zero project and the decarbonization strategy in the way we're doing this is helping us big time to attract talent. So that is telling us that it's not only our employees, the community, but also the labor uh, market. The same with suppliers. Suppliers also have their own decarbonization strategy. So we took the path to do it now and to do it in Ghana. I'm Bob Masterson. I'm the president and CEO of the Chemistry Industry Association of Canada. I'm your host for the Future of Chemistry interview series right here on the futureeconomy.ca. In this series, we explore the path forward for transforming Canada's chemistry industry for the circular and low carbon economy of the future. In today's episode, we're going to specifically look into the challenges and opportunities associated with the low carbon transformation for Canada's chemistry industry. I'm joined today by Diego Ordonez. Diego is the president of Dow Canada. Diego, thanks very much for joining us today. I think we're going to be coming back to this topic throughout the episode, but let's start by focusing on the major announcement by Dow Canada in December 2023. Yes, the announcement that we made last year confirming the final investment decision to build uh, what we call the, uh, the world's first net zero scope one and two emission settling cracker and derivatives uh, was indeed the major one. And for me, it's not only due to the magnitude of the investment, if you're allowed to say that, and, and don't get me wrong, it's the investment is huge. That will invest 6.5 billion US dollars. Partners are going to invest north of uh, 2 billion US dollars in that investment, which is, is going to position this investment as uh, the largest industrial investment in the history of Alberta, one of the largest industrial investments in Canada. If you take the Dow history, it's going to be the top three, if not the most important one in the history. But I also think, and I think you're going to agree with me here, that uh, this announcement is extremely significant for not only Dow, not only for Canada, but for the entire global chemical industry. You know? Here we are, one of the largest petrochemical companies in the world, announcing that it's going to build a new world-scale cracker and derivatives fully decarbonized, that is uh, on scope one and two, we are capture, compress, transport and sequester CO2. And on top of that, we are saying that we are going to get a return on investment within the Dow investment threshold. Plus, we are going to decarbonize our existing operation, the cracker that we have today. Your Fort Saskatchewan site is just one site in Dow's portfolio. So a couple of important questions for you, Diego. First, probably the most important question, why start here? Why now? in Alberta, in Canada, for what is hopefully the first of many such announcements from Dow. I think it's important to reinforce why we are doing this, why in Canada and why now? And you have seen some chemical companies have decided to follow different paths or approaches. Some companies decide to keep doing what we I call business as usual. So we have examples of companies in the Middle East and in Asia. Others took the wait and see approach, wait for certainty on regulations, wait for certainty on price premiums, uh, which is a hot topic these days and a lot of questions coming our way on that one, you name it. But Dow decided to take a different path, no? That started with what I call an outside in approach. We believe that uh, the global demand for plastic will continue to grow at uh, multiple of GDP. I mean, it could be 1.2, 1.4, or, or eventually more, depending on product differentiation. Our product mix on the Path to Zero project in Alberta is targeting high differentiated products and less commodity-based products. Customers are requesting, and in some cases, they are demanding low carbon products. And it's not only the customer, you go to the investors, the same thing. The path to zero project and the decarbonization strategy in the way we're doing this is helping us big time to attract talent. So that is telling us that it's not only our employees, the community, but also 
the labor uh, market. The same with suppliers. Suppliers also have their own decarbonization strategy. And if they want to be fully aligned with what we're doing. And when we see that trend, we only think that that is going to grow and accelerate in the coming year. So we took the path to do it now and to do it in Ghana. Before the announcement, and you personally know this, we have been exploring this opportunity for a while globally and especially in Canada. But we had to determine how we were going to capitalize on that. Because as I said, business as usual was not an option and wait and see represented an opportunity lost because that opportunity was in front of us. But at the same time, accelerating and compromising the lower internal investment was not an option either. And you know that fully decarbonized petrochemical complex or any industrial operation at this point in time and probably in the future as well requires a higher investment than the conventional one, being capex or operational. So I think the first thing when we analyze this is the, what I call the checks, check the box type of approach for any investment on what I call the necessary conditions to do any chemical investment or petrochemical investment. Long-term feedstocks have availability, volume, competitiveness, brownfield. So that's critical. Something that is critical for us is the safety and reliability operational track record of any operation. So earning the, the right to get the money and, and the investment. Once you have, you check those boxes is how we find a clear path to decarbonize and reduce, offset the cost of decarbonization. In our specific case, because the cost was higher, as I mentioned, we laser focus on finding those offset. The other ones are key partnerships. We wanted to focus on the things that we know what to do and the, the areas that require capital and expertise that we are not experts, like hydrogen production. We chose Linde to be the ones leading that effort, supporting the hydrogen that we need for us. Infrastructure, we have Ravago. And then you have the government incentives for decarbonize and also for attracting investment to grow the economy, which is clear in the case of uh, Alberta. And one thing which is very important for this project and for future one, which having a legal framework that uh, supports market-based mechanism for reducing industrial emissions, like uh, Alberta tier system and the pricing. Those were key things that we took into consideration, critical for this project. And also, if you allow me to say, the team that is going to execute because in the Excel spreadsheet, everything works, even the numbers and the suppliers and, and everything. But the team that is has been assigned to execute this project is what I will call it dream team. So these are the guys that lead the implementation of the project, not only the last mega project in the Gulf of the U.S., Gulf Coast in the U.S., but also working in Saudi Arabia on the Sedara project or before in Thailand. So it's, it's really dream team. And that is a must in order to implement a project like this. Other industries or oil and gas companies that can execute projects like this, I can afford delays and even much higher capex, we cannot. And the team executing it is absolutely critical. That's a lot of things that had to go right. You had to have the feedstock, you've had to have the experience, you had to have partners, not only in your supply chain, but also governments. And you also talked about having an experienced team that built a very successful and profitable plant in Texas that helps build confidence in this. But I know a key part of your project is also going to be associated with carbon capture and storage. How does that fit into why here in Alberta at this time? In Alberta, we have a legal framework and as infrastructure in place that is going to allow one to transport the CO2 that uh, we are going to capture, compress, and sequester as, as part of the project. So the Alberta trunk line, that's, it's a key component on the why Alberta or why Canada. And then the legal framework and the geology that is going to allow key companies to sequester the CO2 that uh, we are going to capture. That is a big part of that. And the governments, they recognize that competitive advantage that, that Alberta has and they are incentivized and spending quality time 
in order to be sure that uh, this is going to grow. So this is a key part of our project, yes. Yeah, it's a key part, right? We often hear from critics that, oh, carbon capture is an unproven technology and it doesn't work. And yet we have the infrastructure, we have the geology in Alberta, and it's been done for decades. So it's fantastic that you folks are progressing on that line. We've talked a bit about this project, but, you know, Dow has big global climate ambitions, and perhaps you can share those, but also talk about some of the other emission reduction activities that are being proposed by Dow and that are moving investment decisions forward in other jurisdictions and how those might relate to future activities in Canada as well. It's clear that to advance or so progress on, on our plan to decarbonize, we need to, and this is a Dow approach uh, that uh, we follow, is uh, science-based, if you want, to find affordable paths to carbon neutrality, which applies a, a combination of existing technology and next generation technology to really achieve the goals that uh, we have at, at the global basis. First is optimizing our facilities and, and process, increasing the use of clean energy, collaborating to tackle upstream emissions, which is key part of the whole emissions landscape, and developing uh, low carbon products and technologies for our customers. There are certain areas where we are spending most of the time and resources. Hydrogen, as is clear in the case of the Alberta project, is, is a key one. So hydrogen is an important resource that will enable economies to meet the net zero goal, not only in Canada, but also globally. The other area that uh, we are focusing a lot is under nuclear. We need power and we need steam. And we truly believe that uh, the nuclear is a critical mechanism for industry to reduce emissions. And for us, that is through electricity and steam. We, as an industry, we are consuming a lot of steam. So we are advanced uh, small modular reaction technology with X energy. This is publicly announced. And we think that uh, it's going to be critical for now to, to the past to net zero emissions. So. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable. No one can doubt uh, the ambitions and intent of Dow. Not only are you embarking on the world's first net zero petrochemical facility right here in, in Alberta, but you're also the first company to pursue with your partners the use of SMRs, small modular reactors, for combined heat and power to decarbonize uh, the energy supply to a major petrochemical facility. So you've got two firsts in the world going on, not only first in the world for the chemistry sector, but first in the world pretty much for any industry. So it's quite remarkable, and we look forward to seeing how those uh, roll out in the years to come. Let's uh, switch a bit to the question of economics. You hinted at this, but there's obviously a cost to transform the Fort Saskatchewan site to build the new facility and to transform the existing facility to a low carbon facility. Can you share a rough estimate of what's the difference between if you were just to build the next facility to produce the products for your portfolio that isn't decarbonized versus the additional cost to get this done in Alberta? The cost is higher. No? You compare if you, if you need to switch fuel from gas to hydrogen, and then you need to do the, the entire capture, sequestration, transportation of this CO2. Our challenge to make the final investment decision is to work on offsetting those extra costs. Because in all the economics that we put together when, when we went to the board for a final investment decision, we were not including and we are not including any upside value for the, the low emissions. It was a big challenge for the team because we say we need to get this project within the IRR or economic threshold and find ways to offset that um, key dynamic is related to the working with the municipal, federal and provincial governments in order to get the support through incentive and regulations. And, and let me tell you that uh, we have a lot of discussions, but uh, the three areas of the uh, Canadian government supported this project big time with a lot of flexibility. It was not easy for them and, and for us, but uh, we are going to get huge support from the government in order to implement this project. We have certain areas that uh, right from the beginning, we highlighted that the potential risks, for example, exchange rate. Once we get the final investment decision, we hedge big part of the, the currency exposure. There, we lock in 100% of the large equipment. Also, we 
lock uh, some shop space. Having certainty around the space for building those equipments and the capability of the companies was critical. So we did the assessment and we lock in also the contracts in order to do that. Labor is another big thing. We're going to have close to 7,000 people at the peak working uh, there. So getting labor agreements in place before FID was absolutely critical to getting access to ethane. We knew that the ethane was available, but before FID, we wanted to have long-term agreements in place you know, to be sure that once we are up and running, the ethane at competitive prices are going to be there. So we lock in 80% of the of the ethane for that project and it's done. It's everything. It's about the risking, you know, to progress with this project. The other important thing, and you are aware of this, so the community for Saskatchewan, the support that we are getting is very important. But then you have the whole dynamics of indigenous communities that uh, we had from the very beginning engaged with the communities that nearby for Saskatchewan. And we see this an opportunity not only for them to benefit out of the project, but also for us. Because some of these nations, we are working with them, they have business in place and expertise that can support us. So we are making efforts and reducing risk in several areas related to the project. Diego, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Future of Chemistry interview series and to share your perspectives and and the huge ambitions of Dow, both with this project in Fort Saskatchewan, but also your other low carbon and circular economy projects worldwide. I want to leave the last word to you. If our viewers were to tune in again for a second conversation with you in 2030, how do you think you'd be describing the state of the chemistry sector in Canada and the transformation for the low carbon and circular economy? Yeah, interesting question. So my view would be that the discussions about premiums, the discussion about uh, the uniqueness of linking a, a new petrochemical project to CCUS, discussions around possible and uh, economically feasible circularity projects by 2030, it's going to be a norm. We are going to be executing and also producing normally at those levels. Our project is going to be up and running. I think it's going to be more certainty about the registration and the value of the life cycle assessment on the on carbon in, in the products that we sell and being commercialized. But there are going to be other challenges, I, I think, like water. So now we are focusing a lot of, uh, of water together with circularity, carbon, how we keep producing and doing more with less water. As an industry, we'll keep having challenges in this. The industry is going to respond to to that. I think this is is a constant that we have seen in the past. It's it's not going to change, but I truly believe as an industry and as DAO, for sure, we are making big moves ahead and on on those challenges. Well, that's a great place to end, Diego. We started talking at the start of the episode about the opportunities and the challenges. And you finished by saying, yeah, by 2030, there's gonna be more opportunities and there's gonna be more challenges. So it's a great way to end. If you want more conversations like these, make sure you subscribe to the futureeconomy.ca's newsletter. You'll be notified of future episodes in this series and there's more topics to come the transformation to the circular economy for plastics, the hydrogen economy, and the role of the chemistry industry in driving a more sustainable economy in the future. We'll also talk about how we attract these investments to drive these very important and far-reaching transformations. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm Bob Masterson, President and CEO of the Chemistry Industry Association of Canada, and I'm your host for the Future of Chemistry interview series right here on thefutureeconomy.ca. Thank you.